Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Limit 55. I'm your host, Daniel, and today we're going to be road testing this, the 1958 MGA. Let's do it. Pretty, isn't it? It was designed in a time where curves, thrills, and image were paramount, and seat belts weren't. The MGA was designed to be so good looking that it would save the company that conceived it. A two seater flash of lightning for the road, born from this. Five international records were smashed at 245 miles an hour. This prototype, which set the land speed record for its class at the Bonneville Salt Flats, was the genesis of the MGA road car. Two miles a minute in a production sports car costing less than 1,300 pounds. British technical prowess, or maybe it was just the lab coats and mustaches, gave them the ability to make a car go fast on the track. And they were good enough at it that people went mad for it. People bought MGAs because it made them feel cool, it made them feel like stars. Petula Clark, Elvis Presley each had them. It was striking and supposedly very fun to drive. MG was so proud of this car that they actually started back at the beginning again. Before the war, they'd gone all the way to P, the MG P type. And then after the war, they started right back at the beginning of the alphabet, the MG A. They actually called it the A, a new birth. Here, the public saw for the first time a new and remarkable product of the MG stable, the prototype of the car which was soon to become world famous as the MGA. But is that true? Is the MGA really that cool? Does it make you feel like a race car driver? I don't know, but I think we should find out. This particular MGA, Helen's Wheel, is special not only because it's dedicated to my mother, but because I painstakingly restored it from this to this. A gunmetal grey classic British sports car designed to be the best way of experiencing what Southern Californian roads have to offer. But how does it actually do out on the open road? Well, straight away, you can see this long bonnet stretching out in front of you. It's as long as Gene Simmons' tongue. And you're sort of cocooned in curves everywhere. The dash is curved, the bonnet is curved, the wings are curved, the hips behind you are curved. So things are looking good. When the MGA made its racing debut on the world stage in 1955 at the 24 Hour of Le Mans, it came 12th and 17th, which doesn't really sound like anything to write home about. But when you take a car that came 12th in the 24 Hours of Le Mans in the 50s and you put it on the road, suddenly things don't seem all that bad. isn't light, but it sort of has a nice weight to it. it. It actually handles quite brilliantly because you just put it into corners and you just steer it with the throttle. You just get that bit of lift off oversteer and it's, <laughs> it's brilliant. It doesn't get any better than that. And I put polyurethane bushings in the suspension and slightly fatter tires so it grips the road quite well. When you're driving, you see the light bouncing off the gunmetal gray paint and it, it's almost like you're in a dream. It doesn't have the notoriety, so to speak, of James Dean's Porsche or the fame of 
Steve McQueen's Jaguar XKSS, but it still makes you feel like you're one of them. And that's all that matters. I think. And maybe you just see yourself as Steve McQueen or James Dean in your head or that's how other people see you when you fly by. But after living with it for a while, sometimes it feels like a car that was built on Christmas Eve by people who wanted to go home. Whoa! Like there. I mean, you know, the interior, the seats, are, they feel like park benches with the back slats taken off. There's no lumbar support, you know? The ashtray isn't really for Bridget Bardot's convenience. It's for holding the bolts that fall off the car. And the gauges, well, there's four of them and only two work. And there's not really anywhere to put your phone, so you can forget that as well. And when it comes to having an audio track to match the vintage feel of the moment, well... There's no stereo in the car, and sometimes you want to listen to music, but none of this Canyon West or Billy Eyelash, no. Sometimes you want to listen to stuff old enough to come on one of these. Maybe not my most practical fix. And then there's the beating heart itself, the soul of the car. The engine. It's a cast iron, low stress, robust, four cylinder lump of an engine, designed by the British Motor Corporation to serve saloon and sports cars for decades. The 1.8 liter engine I rebuilt for this car is talky, but when you go up a steep hill like this, it feels a bit like asking a, a dog which has wheels for back legs to run up a hill. It's all wound out and it just feels a bit abusive somehow. But once you get going, it's all right. Wire wheels and single piston disc brakes make the car fun to drive and stop quickly and it's perfect for a car that weighs just under 2,000 pounds, which isn't necessarily always a good thing. But it doesn't matter that the engine doesn't have gobs of power and the seats are a bit uncomfortable. I know I'm biased because I rebuilt this car but it really does make you feel special. In the same way that when old retirees take up oil painting and they think they're Turner all of a sudden, this really does make you feel like you're Elvis or Steve McQueen. And it's no more apparent than after the sun goes down and the lights come on, things blur, and it really feels like you're time traveling. It's like you can see something that no one else can see. It's like time travel goggles. But I think most importantly, you drive it today for the same reasons that everybody drove it back then. 
it makes you feel cool. It's exhilarating. It's nimble. It takes you back in time. It looks incredible. It's exciting. Back then, this car made you feel like a race car driving star. And this one that I've kept alive makes you feel exactly the same way even today.